Hey guys, I'm Tom Friedhoff. I'm one of the engineers here at Active Lamp. Last week I wrote a blog post about our Drupal 8 build process, and today I want to take you guys through what that actually looks like. So we use a tool called Vagrant, and what Vagrant does is it helps us to manage our virtual machines as well as provision those virtual machines. We've been using Vagrant for years with tools such as Puppet, Chef, and Ansible, uh, but today I'm actually going to talk to you guys about using Vagrant with Docker. We've worked with many of the popular provisioners within Vagrant, including the three that I just mentioned. But if you're just getting into it, I'd recommend you check out Ansible. Ansible is probably the lowest barrier to entry to learn. Plus, it's just cool that you don't have to install any software on the remote machine that you're configuring. You just need a control machine that has Ansible on it and Python on the remote machine to, uh, to configure that machine. For the particular project I wrote about in my blog post, we're using Vagrant with Docker. Docker, in my opinion, is the future of hosting. Well, containerization is the future of hosting. And hosting companies like Pantheon, they've been using containers forever. All right, so where is this blog post that I keep referring to? Go check out this link right here to give that a read. If you don't have the time to go take a look, let me show what you guys are missing. All right, so here's that blog post that I wrote about uh, our build process on Drupal 8. Uh, it's really a 10,000 foot view of what we're doing, but we've got some great information in here. Um, what steps we take to actually build this. There's our Vagrant file. You guys can pull that uh, and use anything you want from there. We've got our Docker file for our Drupal 8 container. You guys can see how that's configured. Uh, we use a make file to actually execute over and over, so that goes in our make file. And then we have some shell scripts here that uh, actually build and rebuild Drupal. We've got some Drush make files so you can see the dependencies for this particular project and, uh, and how they get included in the different make files. A lot of good information here. Make sure you go check this out. If you've got a photographic memory, maybe you just consumed all that content right now. Okay, so I've just unloaded a whole bunch of buzzwords on you and I haven't shown you anything about our build process. I promise I'm getting there. But first I wanna show you a few more buzzwords about how this is all put together. So we use a series of build tools to construct our Drupal site. One of the reasons why we do this is we only want to keep our custom code in our application repository. There's no reason for us to store any of those dependencies that we depend on in our application repository. We're not changing those files anyway. It's just adding more space to our repo. Bundler is a package management for doing Ruby development. We're not doing any Ruby development, but as you can see here in our gem file, we are including some Ruby dependencies. We're basically using Ruby to download Compass, you know, and a couple other libraries that we need uh, for our SAS compilation. NPM is the Node Package Manager. We're not doing any Node development either, but we also have Node dependencies. Let me show you the package JSON file. You can see that we are downloading one dependency called Bower uh, for our build process. That leads me to our next build tool called Bower. Bower is a front-end dependency manager. And so Bower is in our theme, and our theme here is called Promise. You can see we have a bower.json file. And so Bower is used for downloading front-end dependencies like Foundation or Font Awesome. Here you can see we're downloading Foundation 5.5, uh, a version of Modernizer, and we're making sure that jQuery uh, is greater than or equal to 2.10. The next dependency manager I want to talk about is Composer. If you've been in the PHP community very long, you know that Composer was a game changer. That's what the whole PHP renaissance was based around. And so we use that tool to bring in any third-party libraries that we want to pull down from Packagist. Let's take a look at our Composer JSON file that we have in the root directory. You can see in here, we're actually just requiring Drush because we just need to get Drush installed on this machine. However, we are using Composer within our custom modules. And if I open that up here, modules custom and let's go to core you can see that I have a composer JSON file here that's pulling in a couple symphony components uh, as well into the Drupal installation and so we use a module called composer manager that actually reads the composer JSON files that are in all the modules that are installed on our Drupal site it puts that into one composer JSON file at the root of the Drupal installation and then it basically downloads all the dependencies once and the entire Drupal installation will share the components that you've defined in your Composer JSON through the PHP namespacing that's become very popular these days in PHP development. All right, so the last tool I want to talk about is Drush. 
So Drush is the Drupal shell. It manages Drupal dependencies, but it does a whole bunch more. And you'll see that as we get into our demo. It allows you to enable modules, do site installs, clear cache, a whole bunch of different tasks. But this whole process is really based around Drush when it comes to building our Drupal site. As you can see here, I have some Drush make files. And we actually build our environment based off this dev make file. You can see here the dev make file. Uh, we've got a project called Devel pulled in there. We're including a project or a make file called APA CMS. And if we open that, we can see that APA CMS actually has the modules that we need to download for our application. Uh, and at the top of that, you can see that APA CMS includes a Drupal make file called uh, Drupal Core. And so if we go there, we can see that we're downloading Drupal 8.0.0, and we're actually applying two patches uh, to Drupal Core. And so this is where the power of Drush Make comes into play. For us to upgrade Drupal Core, it takes one step. We just needed to up change this number right here, 8.0.0, to 8.0.1, and rerun our build, and we've got an updated Drupal Core. It also makes it super simple to patch. You know, no longer do you have to actually go in there and manually apply patches. With Drush Make, you can just specify an array of patches to apply to this core, and you can do this with modules or profiles as well, and Drush Make will automatically patch those files. Using Drush Make is awesome because these make files basically become manifests of all the modules I'm using in my project and all the patches. So when a new developer comes on board, they can easily just go to these make files, see what modules are actually being pulled in, any patches that are being pulled in, and it's all right there in these make files. Okay, so it's time to show you something. Let's go pull up that repo that I talked about in the blog post last week and pull that down to our local machine. Okay, so let's pull up the repo and actually clone this so we, I can show you what's happening. So I'm gonna copy this URL right here. And it's always a good idea to clone from your fork. Uh, so that's exactly what I'm gonna do here. Okay, so now that I have this uh, downloaded, I'm gonna CD into the directory that I just cloned. And if I look at the instructions uh, for this repository, we see all the, prerequ the prerequisites that we need for this repository. And we can see to make a local web server, I just have to execute one command, make all. Now, we've actually refined this process since my blog post. In my blog post, this was two commands, but you know now it's one command. Let me show you what this is actually doing. So if I open up our make file uh, over here, let me collapse this, and then go into this make file. We can see that make all is actually executing three different commands. And so it's running the init command, the install command, and the sync command. And you can see those commands here respectively. Install, or excuse me, init, install, and sync. And so basically what it's doing is it's going through those tools that I just described. It's first going to initialize your project. It's going to run bundle and, and basically look at the dependencies in this jump file. It's then going to run composer install and download, look into it, download the dependencies that are in this file. And if you remember, that was just Drush. And then it's going to download uh, or run npm install and pull the dependencies out of the package JSON file. And if you remember, that was Bower. The next step that it does is it goes into our theme at this particular path and it runs Bower install. And that installs foundation, modernizer, and ensures that jQuery is at the correct version. Once that's done, it goes back to the project root directory, and it, we execute a bundler command. And so from this bundle statement here, we downloaded uh, compass and a few of the dependencies. We execute that command using bundle execute, compass compile, and we're saying compile the SAS in this directory. And last, it's running the vagrant up command to actually bring up our environment. And then so in the install step, once the environment is brought up, it jumps to the install step and we can see that we, we're using Drush and a site alias, as well as a, it looks like, a, and I'll show you here in a second, a, a command alias to actually install Drupal. And once that's done installing Drupal, it goes down to a sync command and it uh, automatically syncs the Drupal 8 container. And so the way our process works is we, we develop locally on our host machine and we have Vagrant manage syncing the files to our remote machine. Um, and the reason why we do this is it's much faster to work on your local 
uh, environment in your native file system than it is to, to actually do something over the network using SSH FS or some sort of network file share. And even though it's a local uh, virtual machine, it's there's still some latency there. We've just found that it's best to actually develop on your native file system and just think those files over. It only takes a couple seconds for those files to sync over and you don't have the performance hit uh, uh, that you would get in your IDE if you're developing over a network file system. We have a couple other commands here that we use. Uh, I'll just really quickly go over those. Uh, so we do use a, a technology called OSX Fuse. And, and when we want to actually mount the doc root that's in our Drupal 8 container, we, have, we can execute a command called make mount. Uh, we can execute any of these commands directly. So if we want to watch our SAS, we can type in make watch and that'll, that'll automatically watch our SAS. <clears throat> so we basically use this make file as, again, another manifest uh, for the popular commands or the most used commands that, that we use while we're developing on sites. And so let me show you what this, this Drush uh, command, how this actually works. And so we're using a site alias here called at dev. And so if I go into my Drupal directory and into the config directory, we have a aliases.drushrc.php file. And so you can see here, uh, we've got an alias at dev that specifies where this uh, dev site actually is and how to actually log into that. Uh, you, we saw that it was installing, or it was, it was running a command called install.sh. That's a shell alias that we've also got in our, our Drush. So when we, when we execute that command, it's actually executing this shell alias, which is really executing this file on the remote file system. And since we're syncing all these files over to the remote file system, uh, it's very important that uh, when you're developing, you have your Vagrant rsync running so that this has the latest file, but this will execute the file that is basically in this bin directory right here. And so you guys can read more about uh, these files in the blog post, but basically this file uh, rebuilds and installs Drupal as well as imports the, uh, the config sync directory. And then if we go to our rebuild.sh file, this actually goes through the process of, of downloading a Drupal. And you can see right here, we're actually running the drush make command with the dev.make into the document root environment variable uh, that we specified. All right, so let's go back to uh, the readme file. And so much of what I just talked about, we, we think it's really good practice to, to document how to use your repository. You know, it saves the time of having to uh, talk to any new developers that you need to ramp up on your project, as well as we've got a very strong belief of working asynchronously. We shouldn't need to depend on another developer to tell us how to get our environments up. There should be documentation in place to be able to get that up without the need of somebody else. All right, so let's actually do this and, and type in make all, and let's see what happens. So as we're fast forwarding through this section, you can see that it's executing the commands that I just showed you in the make file. You know, it's downloading the, the Ruby dependencies. It'll, it's downloading the PHP dependencies with Composer, you know, and, and now here it is uh, building the Docker uh, containers. But we'll let, just, we'll let this run for a little bit. Uh, this process normally takes about 20 minutes. Uh, you know, it's downloaded a whole bunch of dependencies from the internet. So at this point, it's really, uh, your time to just take a you know extended coffee break while Docker and Vagrant do the work behind the scenes. Uh, but once you're done, you know once this is done, you shouldn't have to do this again unless you've completely changed your stack. And one thing to mention as well, every once in a while you may need to add things to your Docker containers. One thing that's great about Docker is it has a layered file system. And so if you ever need to add anything to your Docker file, say you need to add uh, I don't know, one more command at the end of your Docker file. Provisioning that machine is much faster because of the way Docker caches uh, uh, each command in that Docker file. Okay, now that that's done, we can see that it automatically went into the Vagrant sync, uh, as I was showing you in the make file. Uh, so just as a reminder, let me pull up that make file again. Uh, these were the steps that it went through, did the Vagrant up, uh, it installed Drupal, and then it went into the Vagrant rsync auto with Drupal 8. So now any files that we change 
within uh, this directory uh, in our profile will automatically get synced to the to the host machine or excuse me to the guest machine. All right, so let's see if this actually worked. And so one of the things that I want to point out before we go look at the site is as one of our prerequisites, we had a vagrant plugin called Hosts Updater. And so uh, if you have this uh, plugin when you're working with Vagrant, it'll auto automatically set your host uh, in your Etsy hosts file to point to the IP address of the, of the Docker host. And so um, just so you guys can see what that looks like in the Vagrant file, if I come over here to host and then Vagrant file, I set up my host name to be apa.dev. So in my Etsy hosts file, that should have resolved apa.dev to this IP address. So let's go take a look and see what uh, happened. Cool, so we have our brand new installation of Drupal. And in that install a shell script, we, we actually set the default password to admin admin. So let's go ahead and log in here. And so there you go. You can see that we've got a freshly installed uh, version of Drupal. It was installed three minutes ago. Uh, one thing that I just want to point out in here is that we did import uh, uh, some configuration sync from our production environment. So if I come over here to configuration synchronization, you'll see that you don't get that error that says your site UUID doesn't match the UUID from your configuration sync. And I just want to show how we did that. Uh, so if you come over here back to our, our profile, we have one function in our uh, install profile. We have a, a function right here that basically uh, goes through all the configuration file in our sync directory and it rewrites the active uh, sync here so that the UUID is the UUID that comes from that uh, sync directory. Drupal 8's got this constraint in place so that you can only share configuration between cloned sites. And so this is how we worked around uh, that, that constraint. All right, so as a bonus, I wanna show you guys how we actually start a project like this. We've got quite a bit going on in that directory structure and there's a lot to copy over. We use a tool called Yeoman to actually get us started. So if, if we had a project, uh, let's call it, I don't know, Active Lamp CMS, uh, and I go onto this Active Lamp CMS, we have a cool little drip command that's used with Yeoman called uh, Yo Drupal All. And that's going to say, hey, you're about to start, uh, you're about to set up a new Drupal site. First answer some questions. What is the short name for the site? Sure, Active Lamp CMS sounds good. What would you like to name the profile? Let's call it uh, my oops, cool profile. It's going to ask you what the machine name for that should be. And sure, we'll just let the machine name be my cool profile. What does the profile do? It does really cool stuff. And so that's going to go into your description of your profile and asks you what host name should we set up for the dev environment. And so that was that host name that I was just pointing out in that vagrant file that you guys saw earlier. And so we'll just go with that. And what version of Drupal are you developing on? So we'll just say we're developing on 8.0.x. And you can see there it's scaffolded the whole project. And now it's actually going through that installation process. Uh, that we just went through. I'm going to cancel this uh, just because that takes a while to show, but I'm going to show you what that actually uh, created here. So if I uh, type the tree command, you can see that with Yeoman, that entire uh, directory structure is now created. And now we can start a brand new project from scratch. All we have to do is go into each of these files and customize them for our particular project. There you go. We have a development environment that can be spun up with one command, as I just showed you. We took about four hours of work of setting up a local environment for a new developer and brought that down to 20 minutes. And that 20 minute was really a coffee break because Vagrant and Docker and all the provisioning tools that I just showed you did all the work. If you like this video, make sure to go check out our website at activelamp.com. Go check out our blog. Go subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you guys want to hear about anything specific regarding DevOps or Drupal, leave us a comment and let us know what you want to hear about. We want to talk about what we've been working with. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you next time.